in the stem culture. Oh, I fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have an intro. Yeah, it's really warm in here. <laughs> Welcome to STEM Culture Podcast. Today, we are talking about disabilities and learning differences. This is your host, Brooke. And Danny. So this is our first in STEM episode, where we hear people's stories, especially those stories we don't hear often. And this episode goes out to all the people who have ever been told that spelling and perfect grammar is the only way to heaven. Damn straight. Uh, So we have a disclaimer this episode, uh, like all episodes, and the disclaimer is just there's literally not enough hours in the day for us to cover every kind of disability or learning difference. Um, So that means that we'll eventually be doing a follow-up episode for this. So if you would like to be a guest, please send us an email at stemculturepodcast at gmail.com. That's all one word. Or hit us up on Twitter at stemculture, also one word. Facebook at stemculturepodcast, just search us. Or Instagram at STEM Culture Podcast, also all one word. If you're in doubt, all one word. <laughs> also, if we make a mistake, which I promise you we were trying very hard not to do so everyone can save their emotional energy for other things, please do let us know. We're really open to it and we do want to be better. All right, y'all. So this topic about disabilities and learning differences in STEM is a hugely broad topic. So in order to understand the interviews that we're going to have later, we're going to give some background. And a lot of this background is actually new, very new to me um, and new in in part, I think, with Brooke. Mm -hmm. So first today, we're going to talk briefly about person first language or identity first language. So person first language would be saying a person with a disability versus identity first language that's saying a disabled person. And so if you ever have questions on how to address someone, always just ask. And so you'll hear us in these interviews that are coming forward in this um, episode that we're asking each person what they would prefer. So the reason why this is so important is just like other groups of people with disabilities, um, not everybody has the same types of disabilities, and everybody has their personal preference on how they want to be addressed. So it's always important to make um, an effort to ask the person, uh, especially if you're referencing their disability for something. Yeah, and so if you wanted to read more about person-first language and identity-first language, uh, we have referenced and linked a few uh, articles for you. Um, one by Emily Ladau from Think Inclusive called Why Person First Language Doesn't Always Put the Person First. And the second is from Stairway to STEM called Autism 101, and they give a great little chat about um, autistic culture and what identity first language means to um, some people who are autistic. And they'll be linked in the show notes. We wanted to learn more about how accommodations are provided to those who need it on campus, so we ended up interviewing uh, one of our local accommodations officers to learn more about disability student services. We have a disclaimer for this because obviously this is our accommodations office at our university, Um, and so there may be some things that we say that aren't 100% correct to your university. And we did make an effort to try and figure out, okay, is this specific to our university or is this nationwide, Um, and where... Uh, we can we make that difference Uh, but really to figure out how your university does things you'll need to go chat with your disability student services or they might call um, themselves an accommodation office so first um we wanted to understand uh how somebody applies and who is um uh available for services And so one of the things that we were told right off the bat is that um, if your university accepts federal funds, they have to provide accommodations. It's the law, and if they don't, it's a civil rights violation. So that was really good to know that um, this is a uh, nationwide um, law. So then we were really curious about how somebody would go about applying for services. And um, first thing that they told us was that you have to self-disclose. 
they can't go out and say, oh, you look like you have a disability. Um, that is a huge no-no to do um, for obvious reasons. And so it's really important that if you know you have a disability that you can identify yourself to the office and then you can show them in some manner, whether it's with current medical documentation, within three years or you'll have to go get a psychoeducational evaluation. And usually that evaluation looks like um, two or three sessions with a psychoeducational evaluator. And the biggest issue I think is that it might not be covered by insurance. And so a rough estimate would be anywhere from 300 to $1,000. And that's a lot of money if you are, <laughs> You know, you're going in, you're asking for help, and then you realize, okay, now I have to go and pay out of pocket. That can be a huge roadblock for somebody. But unfortunately, there are not services that are out there that can help that we know of. If there are, let us know. We can put it in our, um, in our website to let other people know. Yeah, and I think the main thing here is that if you have documentation within three years, you can use that. But they do ask, um, they do let you know that the psychoeducational evaluation is, a, is, is something you can do. And it's so thorough. And essentially it makes it so that they can give you the, the best service that they can. Because you will have been evaluated in so many different ways. And they'll know how to accommodate your needs the best. But obviously if you can't pay for that, you have your own documentation. And that is going to help you too. Yeah. And another thing that um, was mentioned to us is that the more you have on your evaluation, the better accommodations you can get. So let's say they have, you know, this person needs extra time in this room. They'll be able to give you exactly what that psycho evaluator tells you to do. Mm -hmm. um, but they can't do anything more than what the psycho evaluator says. Mm -hmm. So if you were having excess absences and you needed it for some reason you just need to have that in writing and they'll be able to give accommodations um, regarding absences or mm -hmm. things like that just as an example yeah and when we were talking to the accommodations office um, they mentioned that people with ADD um, and ADHD, uh, people with learning differences, and um, anybody with a psychological disorder, they're really the most common students that seek out accommodations. So let's say if you have a psychological disorder, your psychologist or psychiatrist um, really should write down, not necessarily your with the name of your disorder, your diagnosis, um, but they should be writing down what accommodations would be most useful for you because that helps the accommodations office the most. It really goes a long way. We were really curious about if there's a difference in accommodations for undergrads in compared, uh, comparison to graduate students because um, I think some people who have accommodations in undergrad might not realize that they can have accommodations in graduate school, and that's really important. So a lot of the same accommodations apply. So if you have that same documentation, you can still get the same um, accommodations when you come into graduate school at, in regards to um, a classroom environment. Um, so some of the accommodations that graduate students might have are, um, well, you know, some of the common things that we have in graduate student or in graduate school are in-class exams, take-home exams, final papers, final projects. Um, but you can get ex extra time on exams and take an exam in a private room. You can also have a note taker or a special reader, or there are websites that as long as you have um, a letter of from a, a psycho evaluation that um, you can get textbooks that are read to you just like Audible. Um, so that could be really helpful as well. Also, you do get, um, you can get preferential seating, uh, preferential parking. You can get exceptions to missing classes. And um, if you have a physical disability and the building that your schedule, your class is scheduled in, you can have it 
changed to a different location if it's unaccessible to get to. But um, I think it's really, really important to contact the disability office or the accommodations offices as soon as possible so that they understand the things that you're facing and have plenty of time to make sure that they take care of everything that you need. Yeah, and then um, one of the kind of hot topic things that's going on right now is a lot of students are asking for more time on assignments. So let's say in the syllabus it says something's due a couple months into the semester and students are asking for more time. If that's in the syllabus, um, you're unlikely to get that. Um, And let's say they assign something for a week later and you want more time on that. It can be part of the conversation, but it's just not something that accommodations offices currently offer. Um, But it's something you should definitely talk with the teacher about if you're worried about it. Yes, yes, very good. And um, I think, you know, we've, we've said this already, but I think it's worth saying again, if you don't know where to start, find the Office of Accommodations at your school. That's really the first place to start. Uh, Even if you've not had um, an evaluation, they oftentimes know of places in the area that you're in, who offices who do offer evaluations, um, you know, they're really going to be your number one resource with all of this. Nice. Yeah. And then one of the things that they'll they'll tell you a lot is is you need to discuss and prearrange. Yes. So what that means is if you want accommodations or you think you might want accommodations, go to your accommodations office at the beginning of the semester. That is when they'll be able to help you the most. Um, and then, because uh, the problem with signing up mid-semester, it makes it harder for them to help because you're already partway through and they haven't had time to discuss anything with your teacher or with you and they haven't had time to prearrange any of the accommodations that you might need. Um, I will say though, of course, um, we're saying this with a caveat, there are exceptions to this. Um, But if you can, discuss and prearrange. And in terms of discussion, not only discuss with the accommodations office and your teacher, but it might be worthwhile talking with your TA as well. Yes. Yes, for sure. I think your TAs are um, really, really, it's important that they know what's going on as well. Sometimes you just tell the professor, but you don't fill in the TA, and and there can be a a miscommunication along the way if that goes on. Yeah, or your TA, like me, goes to the final exam day, and five of my students are missing, and I go, (gasps) how did five of them miss this? I'm so worried, and I'm emailing them, and then finally I realize that they were they had accommodations so they were taking the exam elsewhere (laughs) Um, so but that being part of the conversation is important yes so um, the last thing I think that we're going to address with what the accommodations office told us is um, talking about service animals versus emotional support animals and so we wanted to kind of explain what the differences are between that. Um, A service animal can only be a dog or a miniature horse. Which I love. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, These animals provide service. So a seen eye dog, um, I know that there are service animals that warn of seizures or low blood sugar. Um, And they are legally allowed to go everywhere. Um, Now, an emotional support animal can be any type of animal, and they don't necessarily provide a service. So they're not trained animals. um, and Not not necessarily trained. Right. So I would say they're not trained to the point that a service animal is trained for. You know, service animals are trained for a specific job. Mm -hmm. Um, And so... um, that is, um, they, they also, they, uh, the accommodations office here wanted to make it clear that those animals do not have um, public access rights at the same level that a service animal does. So service animals can go to classes with you and into labs, but emotional support animals cannot. 
Yeah, and so since service animals can go into labs with you, there's a couple things um, that need to be discussed. So first is, will the health of your service animal be affected by being in the lab? So that's a conversation you would have with your PI or your lab coordinator, um, etc. And then the second question is, will the outcome of the experiment be affected by the service animal being in the lab? And both those questions are a discussion. So I'm going to interview Brooke now because That's Brooke, me. <laughs> uh, Brooke has uh, some things about her that she wanted to share for this episode. Um, so like with all of our other interviews, we're going to start off first and I'm going to ask her, Brooke, do you prefer identity first language or person first language? Oh, I'm so glad you asked me. <laughs> but I, I also want to say that I honestly didn't think about like one, I didn't know that there was a difference, a different way of addressing this. Mm -hmm. And so growing up not knowing I had a learning difference, I wanted to hide it. And so I, when I started addressing the fact that I had a learning difference, I was a person first. And so I never really even started thinking about it until we started exploring doing this podcast. And I really love that there are people out there who really embrace their difference and feel that that comes and plays into like every part of them. Because thinking through my life, I really think that I am where I am because of my learning difference. But growing up, I tried to hide it so well that that it was always something that I looked at as like a bad thing. Society doesn't like these learning differences because nothing I went through in school growing up really was set up for somebody like me. So I would try to fake it as much as I could. Um, but I love learning that there is a different way of approaching that. And so I think after learning that there is a difference, I love saying I am a dyslexic person. I think that's really powerful. Nice. And then being a mom of a child who has a learning disability, I think I fall into the my child, you know, the same thinking because I am his spokesperson, mm -hmm. and so I'm, you know, he's a person first, and this is, you know, I don't want the world to see him as somebody who has a disability, but that's a hundred percent of his life experiences are as a person who is, um, you know, dyslexic and has dysgraphia and ADHD and all of these things color every aspect of his life. So, you know, I guess I'm taking away the experience from him by saying he is a person with a disability hmm. instead of saying, you know, he is a neurodiverse individual so that those are my thoughts yeah um so when did you find out that you were dyslexic this is so and this is a good question because you know there's always that little voice in the back of your head that says there's something wrong. But I was it was never caught in school. And so that something wrong, that little voice that was telling me this, um, made also made me feel like I needed to hide it. And so I never disclosed, like, I'm having trouble, I'm having a problem. But the signs were all there. It just wasn't paid attention to. And, um, you know, just, just so like everybody knows, I dropped out of high school because I was struggling so bad. And so um, I ended up getting my GED so that I could go to dental assisting school. And I remember being terrified that, like, would I even pass the GED? I did. I was great. But um, so going through, going through most of my life, I didn't even acknowledge it to the forefront. It wasn't until I had a child that was very uh, struggling and I went to, you know, speech therapy appointments, occupational therapy appointments, a lot of them. And I started learning everything I could about him and realizing this is my childhood that I'm experiencing over again with him and, and 
through him, his experiences, I'm learning about myself. And so that's when I started addressing it and really embracing that I have um, a different way of learning. Mm-hmm. And so was that by the time you were doing undergrad? Yes, that was when I was in undergrad. And really where it really showed through was when I was trying to learn French. You know, you have to take a foreign language in order to be able to pass um your your undergraduate and move on to another degree and so which is not the case at all universities it's not the case at all universities just the one that I attended well I shouldn't (laughs) say just the one that I but I luckily chose one that uh, made me look at these things and realize that um, one if I can't spell in the English language (laughs) <laughs> There's literally no way I can spell in French. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm laughing. <laughs> For our listeners out there, Brooke and I are incredibly close. So I'm just imagining her like trying to write a word in a different language and just being like, what the fuck? Yeah, yeah that was pretty much me the entire time. Um, and so that really helped push me towards the accommodations office and like, you know, what do I need to do in order to get help? Because I was such an advocate for my son and had never advocated for myself. Gosh, isn't that so hard? It is. It's so hard. I'm really proud that you did that. Thank you. It was, was, you know, it was a good experience because it made me also appreciate um, the things that are hard. Hmm. You know, those are are the times where you really see... um, where it's great to under, put a name to something you've dealt with your entire life, mm-hmm. but also to look back and say, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that. Yeah. You know, like that, it, it truly is a, a part of who you are. Mm-hmm. So I embrace it. Yes, queen. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So what kind, of, what kind of accommodations were you getting as an undergrad? I was getting extra time on testing, and I was getting um, a private room for testing. Okay. So I would have extra time so I could really work things out. Because one of the things I wanted to kind of explain, um, and I'll touch on this again, but I really learned with my son with dyslexia is that um, people who have dyslexia – need to file things in their brain in a different manner than people who don't have dyslexia. Mm -hmm. So um, that's really important to understand because when you're asking somebody questions in class, a lot of times neurotypical people can pull that file really quickly. Uh But dyslexia people have to file it in multiple locations in order to pull it fast because we have different pathways that we follow in order to get it to those files. Mm -hmm. So one of the ways that I would cope with that is I would um, talk out my notes and I'd make sure I took handwritten notes um, because it files things in in multiple areas so that you can pull it when you're under stress because the first thing that happens when you're under stress is like, you're not pulling any files at all. But if you have them in multiple different areas, you know, your handwriting is going to be filed in a completely different spot than your listening. So y- you have to make sure that you're studying and, and um, really preparing in the right way. Okay. So um, also I would go to my professors at the beginning of every Um, semester and I would explain my situation and uh, I had a professor one semester who we would just go and it was for French and so he knew that I really struggled with it and so he did his testing a little bit different for me because you have to have this oral component where you're speaking answering questions back and forth and so he would just patiently wait no pressure on me at all and I could just play through different sentence structures um, and he was very patient with me on that now that's not something he had to do that Mm -hmm. was because I went to him and I explained um, why I was getting receiving accommodations and I explained to him my worries and I was able to articulate it in a way that he you know felt like 
he could justify giving me the extra time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wasn't, I wasn't even asking for it. He, it was something that he just said, let's do it this way. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So now that you've been in grad school for a couple of years, do you use accommodations or uh, something else? So I'm really glad that you asked that question because up until last semester, I really didn't think that I needed to. And I kind of kicked myself because, you know, most of our grad courses have not had the same structure as undergrad courses. Um, Until last semester, I took a stats class and it was structured very much like an undergraduate class. And I really wish that I had taken advantage of my accommodations. Mm -hmm. But this is where I have to self-disclose and say, I didn't even think that I could have accommodations in graduate school. So that's why exploring a little bit of background about this podcast really opened my eyes to the fact that I should have been asking. And this is where you look back and you go, okay, I should have been asking this whole time. So Mm -hmm. to everyone out there, you have accommodations if you've ha- especially if you've had them in undergrad you know utilize it it's there for you for a reason mm-hmm. so. yeah just because you're a grad student doesn't mean you can't use the accommodations if you want them right? yes yes um nice and thank you so much for explaining you know how dyslexic people are, are pulling files from where they've stored them in their brain i think that was a really great explanation well on top of that i i I've read the book um, Dyslexic Advantage, and that is up on our website as well. Um, and I, that was kind of a, um, a godsend for me when I was kind of trying to navigate my journey and my son's journey at the same time. One of the things that they talk about in the book is how the brains are structured differently. It's not just the filing, but it's how the neurons are laid out. Um, And so... So it's like a physiological difference. It is a physiological difference. And so they explain it as if the brain is modular Mm -hmm. and that you have neurons that... um, carry information over long distances and then you have neurons that are packed tightly together Mm -hmm. and are stacked on top of each other and that uh, people who have dyslexia have more of these long reaching neurons and so they're filing things very differently and then people with autism have um, stacked neurons and so oftentimes that means that they can be really good at specific tasks and you know very skilled you know they're mastering specific tasks and so you have these different brain types but something that I had been thinking about for a long time is that that doesn't mean that this is a disorder that this is more of a phenotype Mm -hmm. you know that you have different brains that are structured differently but that just means that we're just different phenotypes for um, different ways of thinking about things yeah and so you know i i've i'm very sad that it's thought about as a disability when we're just looking at different variations of human beings yeah yeah well one of the things you and i have talked about before is um and in preparation for this podcast is um you know we don't often you know if people someone says dyslexic or someone says autistic and you're doing a word association, almost no one says successful. And yet we know many successful people who are dyslexic or autistic or have other kinds of disabilities. And um, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about that, if you had any special or anybody you kind of follow that inspires you or that you think about. You know, I think um, there are... I think there's a lot of people who are successful out in the world that you wouldn't realize are dyslexic Mm -hmm. um, or autistic. And unfortunately, I don't think that's highlighted because that would really um, help remove the stigma Mm -hmm. of it. But I think it gives 
I, I keep referring back to the Dyslexic Advantage book because it really does highlight that, you know, people are able to solve problems in really spectacular ways when they have this different phenotype. Mm-hmm. And um, I th- there are a lot. <laughs> I keep thinking of um, Anne Rice. Mm-hmm. So I was a teenager when Interview with a Vampire was really, really popular. And everybody <laughs> wanted to be a vampire. <laughs> oh, uh, that's, that's come back now, though. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. All right. So I, I um, really love Anne Rice books. You know, I, like, blazed through them as a kid. Um, and so, which is funny because I'm dyslexic, but I, re- I skim read everything. Mm-hmm. So... <laughs> Um, but anyways, there, um, she was told as a child that she would never amount to anything and that she would never be a writer. She couldn't even, you know, like all of her English report cards were just atrocious. Mm -hmm. And here she is like, and this is actually the case for a lot of top bestsellers, New York Times bestseller list is if you went back into their childhood and looked at the report cards, a lot of them had, you'll never make it as, you know, X, Y, or Z. Mm-hmm. And here they are because they can approach things in, in a way that's outside of the box thinking mm-hmm. um, for neurotypical individuals. And so that's what captures um, these incredible audiences that they want to read these stories because they're, you know, they're extraordinary. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's actually quite common that um, New York Times bestseller authors are dyslexic oh that's cool I didn't know that Mm -hmm. nice I think it's really important that um we are highlighting dyslexia and autism because I think I truly do believe it it's an advantage yeah you know I, I think that um those are usually the people that I feel comfortable with and gravitate towards because you know they're really extraordinary people so yes I can attest to that Brooke is amazing (laughs) you are too (laughs) oh thank you okay so my next question is um I I know you have a so your experience as a kid growing up and not wanting to um kind of express that you were having an issue in school I think that I felt that I was not normal. Okay. <laughs> now I embrace this. Um, but I think I strictly felt that uh, everybody else was getting it okay. and I wasn't. And so I just would hide the fact. But what's interesting okay. about this is I would come up with these way workarounds mm-hmm. um, that <laughs> would essentially be cheats on how to get to different stages where everybody else was because mm-hmm. I couldn't get there the straight and narrow, like the straight road path. Uh-huh. And so I find these workarounds that I could figure out how to get things done without doing it how everybody else did it. But I felt like a failure while I did it. Oh, no. <laughs> but, I mean, that's, that's why um, neurodiverse people are really great to have um, – be in these incredible roles is because they do figure out these workarounds. Yeah. That's what makes them so um, great at problem solving and, you know, doing really extraordinary things because they've had to figure it out their entire life yeah. to not live in a um, – or to, like, live in a neurotypical world. Yeah. Well, that, that makes so much sense to me because uh, my brother has ADHD – and he's like he can MacGyver anything. Mm-hmm. If you, I mean, he's also a mechanic. I mean, that's where his interest lies. Mm-hmm. So he's a mechanic. He knows how to weld. He's just this incredible person that knows how things work and is really interested in how they work. And I can ask him, "How am I going to do this thing?" And within literally five seconds, he's already figured it out, and he's going to help me do it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so that that's very Jared interesting. Would love your brother. Oh my God, they would get along like. <laughs> Yeah. A pair of thieves. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Okay. And that's amazing. So I have one last question. Yes. What do you wish your peers or the listeners of this podcast knew about how you might like to be interacted with? I so my response is not 
completely on how I want to be interacted with, but maybe a um, being socially conscious of something. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lot of people on Facebook and um, I, I think that I've interacted with over the years that will continually make uh, derogatory remarks towards spelling. Mm-hmm. And it might just come off as like something small or funny in a neurotypical environment but as somebody who harbored tremendous shame throughout my entire life you know that could be something that's really hurtful to somebody who is dyslexic so I and I think that people do it unconsciously but you know not realizing the the huge emotional impact that somebody carries with them when they feel like they're not normal or they're not you know that something as simple as spelling you making a small comment um or even people like attacking a comment that somebody makes not on the content but on maybe a spelling choice or uh like not putting a correct grammatical um comma in where it should completely discredits everything that that person just said and I think that that um, I would really love for people to be socially conscious about that yeah and fucking stop it yeah (laughs) yeah and that (laughs) that's my translation (laughs) I like your translation (laughs) well and I want to share this little story before we end Um, it was one day I was trying to find you, and you were telling me what lab to go to. <laughs> I remember this. Yeah, and you were, you were like, it's 365. And I was like, tight. And I'm looking for 365. Can't fucking find the room. And I'm telling you, are you sure it's 365? And you're like, yeah, yeah. And then finally, you took, I think, took a, maybe a little bit more time to look like, mm-hmm. why the fuck isn't Danny here? Yeah. And, um, and you were like, oh, oops, I meant 356. <laughs> And so I came, like, coming in, like, what the fuck? Like, how could you get that wrong? And then you were like, I'm dyslexic. Get over it. <laughs> and I was like, oh, right. Like, you told me that before. Yeah. <laughs> and so then I just started cackling because that's what I do yeah. when I'm being a fucking idiot. Um, <laughs> but I remember that very fondly. And I yeah. just, how forward you were with me, I was like, oh, I'm being an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> and so that helped me self-reflect. And also just remember, like, since I know that you're dyslexic, mm-hmm. then there's times where I don't even have to bother asking you, are you sure about whatever? Right. Because I can yeah. just be like, let me just check this yeah. other thing <laughs> yes. because I can't find. I'm so glad that you do that. <laughs> <laughs> it helps me so much. <laughs> that made me really happy. Okay. Um, end of the interview. Love okay. you. Love you. Hmm. All right. So we also wanted to talk a little bit about ableism and what that is so ableism is a discrimination against disabled people or people who are disabled again that depends on if you prefer identity first language or person first language and honestly i thought one of the articles that we got from stairway to stem called autism 101 put it really well so i'm for the next paragraph going to quote them quote much as racism is part of the daily life for people of color Ableism is part of daily life for disabled people, including autistic people. This includes internalized ableism or feeling as if we should be doing better at fitting in, not needing accommodations or support, not being disabled. Ableism can take the form of microaggression in the form of compliments, such as, you don't seem autistic to me, or you must be high functioning, or even you're so inspiring and so articulate. If these seem far-fetched, all these and more are said on a fairly regular basis to both myself and my students. End quote. So, like with many things, if you recognize that you've done or said any of those, um, the first step is recognize that you're doing it. And so I'm going to give a little example of ableism that I've seen my mom experience. So... My mom had a spinal cord injury when she was 15, and we've interviewed her for this episode. And as a result of that accident, she ended up in a wheelchair, and she identifies as a woman who is quadriplegic, uh, but also as a bunch of other stuff first. So you'll hear that later on. But as a kid, we would go to restaurants, and 
frequently, or maybe not as a kid. I mean, we went to restaurants. Um, but this, I definitely started noticing this once I got a bit older, maybe 15, 16. And many of the hosts would look at me and ask how many people we had, where we wanted to sit, etc. And I learned to just stare at them and not answer <laughs> because my mom would be like, hi, you can talk to me. Wow. That's, I'm just kind of flabbergasted. Yeah, it's really frustrating. Frustrated, and, yeah. Yeah. And when I was older, I definitely would be like, oh, you can ask my mom. Right. Um, yeah. She, she's right here. Yeah. She's the head of our family, so you can ask her. <laughs> she's our pack leader. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Don't <laughs> fuck with her. Yeah. <laughs> um, and for the most part, I mean, you could tell people didn't mean ill by it, but it would happen almost every time we went out to dinner. And so I could see that that was really wearing on my mom. And so sometimes she would um, handle it with a lot of grace and other times she'd be like, hey, you can talk to me. Right. I'm right here. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Although I, my mom never sounds like that. That's just me interpreting her tone. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and so a little footnote here, too, because I'm likely to get some questions. So in case anyone is wondering, yes, my mother physically birthed me and my brother. Um, and a little science uh, lesson, perhaps. What's super cool about the endocrine system and reproduction is that even when someone with a uterus can't physically push during birth, the brain is sending oxytocin to the uterus anyway. And that hormone oxytocin is going to cause the uterus to contract, which helps push the baby out. So, yes, my brother and I really came out of my mom's vagina. And I don't care if I'm oversharing uh, because a lot of women with spinal cord injuries to this day are told they can't have kids. And it's a fucking lie. Um, so if you're out there and you want to have babies, um, just because you have a spinal cord injury uh, doesn't mean you can't. Enjoy. Hi, everyone. I'm Danny here with my mom, Deborah who had a spinal cord injury when she was 15 years old, which is now almost 50 years ago. Um, you might hear a motorized something happening every now and then, and that's my mom's cushion. Uh, she has a cushion that will change the pressure on um, her seat so that she doesn't have more pressure on one side or one part than any other. So, hi, Mom. Hello, Danny. <laughs> So first, Mom, I wanted to ask how you prefer me to reference your disability. Uh, do you prefer person-first language or identity-first language? Well, you know, I've thought a lot about this over the years. And I would, be, I would prefer to not be identified by my disability, as many others would not like to be defined by their gender or some other specific thing about them. Um, I once did a presentation where I said, first I'm a person, then I'm a woman, and somewhere in there, um, there is a recognition that I have a disability. I'm not a disability, but I have one. And when you talk about disability, I, I don't like that, that because that almost sounds like unable. Um, it's interesting, in Spanish, one would say disability, incapacitada, and that means incapacitated. Mm. Um, so, and there's a lot of definitions that go into things like disabled. Um, if I had a preference, and even when I talk, I go back and forth between disabled person and person with a disability. My preference, if I had only those two choices, would be person with a disability, but... I don't want to be defined by my disability. I don't want to be defined by limitations. Um, and so I would just like to be seen as, if I were going to be identified by anything, maybe by my profession, um, maybe by the fact that I'm also a mom. Um, there are other ways to identify me that I would like to, to come first mm -hmm. before before the fact that I have a spinal cord injury. Okay. Which does not make me disabled, mm -hmm. so to speak. And uh, you said, this is my mom. She has a spinal cord injury. 
it was like mom came first. That was great. Mm-hmm. But the very next thing that came was spinal cord injury. And I think over the length of this conversation, you'll see that maybe you'll see that the disability is a very little teeny part of my life. Yeah, and I, I meant, and I really want to say, and I really want to stress that if you have a question about that, how to refer to someone, ask that person. Yeah. Ask that person because we're all different. Yeah. We're not just this group of disabled people that all think the same. Mm-hmm. In fact, with spinal cord injury, oh my gosh, one millimeter of difference where that spinal cord injury occurred along the spinal cord can make all the difference in, in what your limitations or your abilities. And so we're all different. Absolutely. So ask the person how they would like to be identified. Yeah. Okay. That's wonderful. All right. So, oh, and I was going to say, I don't know if you ever knew this, mom, but growing up, I I never told people that you were in a wheelchair, oh. like my, like my friends. And it's not because I was trying to hide it. Mm. I just didn't see how it was important to whatever story mm. I was telling. Mm. And so friends would meet you and they'd be like, I didn't know, you know, whispering to me, I didn't know your mom was in a wheelchair. And I'd be like, oh, well, it wasn't important to any of the stories I was telling. You know, they weren't about the wheelchair. It was about her. Did you ever know that? No, I see that. <laughs> and that makes me feel really good inside because, because it's like, because I always wondered as a mom how that might restrict you as my child. And, and also if you might be a little embarrassed oh, no way. with me, you know, picking you up at school or, or whatever. And so that makes me feel really good inside that, that again, the disability did not come first. Oh, yeah. Mom, I was proud as hell of you. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm sad I didn't say that more as a kid for you to know that. Mm-hmm. But I was super proud of you. And I loved it when you mm-hmm. came to pick me up at school. I just felt like <laughs> I felt super cool. Like my mom's coming to pick me up and her van is like this cool cyborg situation you remember and... <laughs> when when your friends would like to ride on it go yes. up and down and up and down yeah. yeah okay cool okay so obviously i know the answer to this question but um the listeners won't but how did you get injured i was 15 a freshman in high school it was my mother's birthday on march 22nd 1969 begged my mother, please, 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 let's go to the beach the next day. So she reluctantly said, okay. And so we went to the beach and, um, and this little place called Little Corona. And so there's this rock jutting out in, in uh, Little Corona. And on this rock, it says no jumping or diving. But there's a whole line of people up there jumping and diving off of this rock. And I had done it many summers before. Uh, my brother had done it. Um, and so I was up there again, ready to dive off, me and a friend of mine, Melanie. And I wasn't super aware that the tide was out and that the water wasn't very deep. And I was the kind of person that if someone said to me, you can't, I was going to show them that I could. Oh, that's where I get it from. (laughs) So I was standing up there, and these two scuba divers came up to me and said, you know, I wouldn't dive from there if I were you because the water's only coming up to our waist. So I dove in, and something about the dive, either I whiplashed in the middle of the dive or I hit the bottom of the water, of the the sand below, and... um, And at that point, and I didn't know it at the time, but I broke my neck. And the bones that broke splintered, and they cut into my spinal cord. And so it paralyzed me instantly from about the chest down. And that included, as weird as it sounds, that included, although I could move my arms, I had no function over my hands, making me what's called a quadriplegic quad meaning four, so that my four extremities were affected. My legs were completely paralyzed, my arms were paralyzed, but my arms were not paralyzed, but my hands were, as opposed to a paraplegic, meaning two, para meaning two, that means their legs are 
are paralyzed only, but they have full use of their arms and their hands. That's the way I became injured. Um, and spinal cord injury does not only affect mobility, it affects sensation. So for the majority of my body, I can't feel normally. It affects my bowel and bladder. It affects my ability to feel or not feel um, sex. Um, it affects um, my temperature. I cannot temperature regulate. So now that we talked about how your spinal cord injury affected your life, I'm curious how it affected your education. It's a really good question. Now remember, I was 15. I was a freshman in high school. Believe me, I did not want to leave my house. I did not want people to look at me. I was freaking out because I was disabled. Basically, basically, I wanted to die, and that's the truth. So my mom had to fight the school system because there was no mainstreaming. You didn't get to go and be with other students who didn't have uh, disabilities. You had to go to school where everyone was disabled. So it was time to go back to school, and I said, I'm not going. And she said, oh, yeah, you're going. <laughs> and my mother always knew this about me, that I prided myself on my independence more than anything, probably. And she said, so I'll push you, and everybody see that I'm pushing you. Or you can go on your own. Which way do you want it? Ooh, she had me. <laughs> and so I went to high school. They said, if you go to school with her, they said that to my mom. If you go to school with her, then we'll allow her to come back. Okay, now imagine this. I'm in 10th grade, 10th grade, high school, and my mother is in the class with me. I go, that was so hard. That was so incredibly hard. Uh, but at the same time, I probably wouldn't have gone if she wasn't there just by my side the whole way. There were no accommodations. What then happened, in 11th grade, they allowed my brother, I could be in classes with him. And, and then um, by the time senior year came around, they allowed me to go to classes on my own. I didn't have to have anybody with me. Um, and, and that gave me the confidence to know I could go, do, be on my own. So my mom said, you know, your plan before your injury was to go to college, and there's no difference now. You will continue to go into college. And so I went to a four-year university, that in high school, you know, everybody's thinking about what do you want to do? What do you want to do? What do you want to major in? Um, and everybody looked at me and said, well, you can talk. Assholes. Why don't you major in psychology? Why don't you be a psychologist? Before my injury, I loved animals and I wanted to work with animals. I wanted to do something with animals. And they're saying now, well, you can talk. So why don't you be a psychologist and work with people? And... I just, I, I felt deflated. I felt like this balloon that was going up, up, up in the air. Somebody just poked it, burst it, and my dream was over. My, I majored in psychology. Um, I got a scholarship, a full year scholar, a full four year scholarship to go to um, this university because of my grades in high school. Everyone always assumed that, wow. She got good grades and she's disabled. Like people with disabilities can't, there's already this thought that you, you can't do well. Mm -hmm. And so if you do anything just normal, like other people, they think, oh, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Like that was a surprise to them that, they, that one can be disabled and still be successful. That was like, wow. And so I later resented those kind of comments. Yeah. So what year is it when you started college? I started college in 1972. Okay. And at this time, did you have your splint? I have a hand splint. And the hand splint, it allowed me to hold a pen, to hold a toothbrush, to hold a makeup brush, so that I could be more independent. And my really my hand splint and my wheelchair were the two things that increase my independence so that I didn't need to rely on other people. So I was able to write independently. But when I went to college, there was a, um, a what's called a Disability Resource Center. And it was really interesting. First of all, 
I refused to identify myself with this disabled group. And part of it was that I was in complete denial that this disability was going to last, which is very common when you become disabled, when you have the significant loss. You just deny that it's um, going to last. And so I sort of, I'm, I have this friend to this day that says basically, you know, you were a bitch. <laughs> and uh, you were hard to get to know. You snubbed us. You were rude. And later on, as that part of me got softer and softer, and I began to talk to these other individuals, it was so refreshing because I needed that. I needed their support. I needed to know about their experiences. Um, and uh, and so it got better, and, and they were going, well, at last. <laughs> and it was where I was also being more accepting regarding my spinal cord injury. Um, you know, they say that, that you, uh, you go through denial, you go through bargaining, like, please, God, make me, make me better. Uh, if you do that, I'll do this. You go through bargaining, you go through, or you go through anger. And oh, I had anger big time. Um, and, but at the end, apparently you go through something called acceptance. Acceptance is different for everyone. And I refuse to accept it. And bottom line for me is that if I think about it, I think about the fact that I was healed. And I wasn't healed so that I could walk again. I was healed so that I still had power as a person with a disability. I had power. I could do things. I could make choices. So when I was undergraduate school, um, they had something called a Disability Resource Center. And it was great because if I had a physical need, say, the bag I peed into because I had a, a catheter inside my bladder. And so my bag might fill up. I could go in there and they would empty it for me because I didn't have, I should say, I needed care of someone to bathe me and dress me and help me with my bowel and bladder care, get me up in the morning, get me in my wheelchair put me down to bed at night, position me. Um, so quite a bit of care went into that. But I didn't have what, what was called an attendant. I didn't have an attendant the whole day. And when I was in school, I did not have somebody with me, going around with me to all my classes. I could now independently write with the help of my hands. But what they did provide in the disability resource centers, they provided note takers. And so that meant that they would actually employ someone in your class who, who, who you might think took good notes and they might, um, uh, I might suggest to them, could you be my note taker? And that the Disability Research Center has funds and they will pay you to do that. Nice. So they had note taking. They had, um, and, and it just began to be, we talk about culture. It, it just began to be a place that you could also just hang out and that had a, a learning um, um, disability center there as well, where they could do testing to see if there might be something causing um, your limitations to learning. Um, and they had, uh, they, had a, they had part of that was maybe like a, a career center, but it all was surrounding disability. And, and, and the, the center itself, provide a sort of a haven like if you were out there feeling like you were really being stared at and it was uncomfortable or you could go into this disability resource center and it's like oh, okay everybody here is you know got the same sort of thing going on and we all understand each other and and uh it was it was comforting it really was comforting um but they provided a lot of services and and accessibility boy that campus was just perfectly accessible. And if it was not, say for instance, you could not get to a class because there were stairs and there were no elevator, the Disability Resource Center would say, you have to move the class. Nice. And so it, it, it was very accommodating at that university. And, and that, was in the, that was in the 70s. Nowadays, 
is uh, like testing accommodations where if you need it, you can get a uh, time and a half or maybe even twice as much. Did they also give you that? In fact, I was in a class where I was not doing well um, because I didn't know how people did it, but in their exams, their final exams or whatever, man, these people were writing a mile a minute and I mm-hmm. could not write that fast. Okay. And so, but I was determined <laughs> to be like them and I wasn't going to ask for extra time because I thought it was cheating. Mm-hmm. And so, but this professor of mine knew that I knew the answers, but I just couldn't take, I would not take the time. He goes, Deborah, I insist that you ask for more time and you will be given it. So I took more time and my grade back came back A. Mm-hmm. He goes, I told you. <laughs> so so since then, since then, yeah, they would give you more time for exams. Okay. Um, you could record lectures. Um, you could uh, anything that would make it easier for you. They and, and if there wasn't this specific accommodation uh, available, they would make changes. So okay. it, and that was part of the reason why my mother chose that university for me to go to. Oh, cool. Yeah. Okay. So what happened in college, I started out as a major in psychology. I'm sorry for all those people that love psychology. I was bored to tears. <laughs> and then I took this class called Social Behavior of Apes, I think it was. It changed my life. I wanted to be the Jane Goodall. I wanted to travel the jungles and observe the animals. And and now I thought, can't do it. But when I took that class, I realized that I could observe animals anyway. I could observe animals at zoos. And my big thing was sort of animal welfare. And, you know, I really, really thought I knew, and Jane Goodall proved this without a shadow of a doubt, that animals feel they have mental health. I could still study animals. I could observe them. I could I could be a scientist. And I could do more than talk. And I began to take classes like that. And I had one teacher, one mentor, who just she said, you know, part of her class was to go to zoos and take take down data and I just wanted more and more and more of that. So it was time. Uh, so I changed my major from psychology to a double major called psychology and psychobiology. It was wonderful. It was, uh, it was just what I wanted. It was, it, it was a way, when we talk about identifying myself, it had nothing to do with disability. It had to do with like, when I thought of myself as a scientist, Oh, every part of me just, I mean, it's like, like right now talking about it, I get goosebumps. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so then I went on to grad school. So I was curious at UC Riverside, which is where you went to undergrad, right? Yes. I was wondering how difficult it was to set up your accommodations. Did they require a lot of work from you or was it fairly straightforward? It was fairly straightforward. It didn't, didn't take much effort on my part at all. I just needed to be able to say, this is what I'm having trouble with. Sometimes that was hard to identify, but that's, they had questions and I was able to answer them and they uh, told me what their services entailed and so it was pretty straightforward. And did you choose UC Riverside for any special reason? Actually, my mother chose uh, UCR because she talked around to universities. It wasn't that far from where we lived and it turned out to be a really great fit. Um because of its accessibility and because of the Disability Resource Center and because they also added an additional service and that was that students that might want to be an attendant uh, applied and you could go through that, their applications to see if there might be somebody there you might want to hire. You said you went to grad school and you have one master's and then another master's ABD, which means all but dissertation. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what kind of accommodations you received for that mm. at those universities? This was another accommodation, but the Department of Rehabilitation, which was a, a state-run program, paid for education uh, as an undergrad, as a graduate student, 
And the idea was to make you employable. And they uh, were going to pay for my graduate program. However, this is one area in which, um, unfortunately, I made a mistake. I said I wanted to get a bachelor's, a, a, a graduate degree in psychobiology. They said, nah, we don't think you can be an empl- employable as a psychobiologist. No, we don't think we can pay for that. But they said, but because you like science and you like people, maybe you'd like to be a medical social worker and we will pay for that. And I don't know what happened there because I needed the funding. I didn't say no. And so I went to San Diego State University. Again, the accommodations there for people with disabilities were very wonderful. Well, they were wonderful, very accommodating. And by that time, I knew what to expect. I knew what I could have. If I needed it, I knew to ask for it. And I did. I started a graduate program in social work at San Diego State. And a year into the program, I knew it was not me. And so I began to explore the university and I found out that there's something called a special master's. And so I began to combine biology, psychology, and anthropology to develop a master's in animal behavior. And I felt alive again. I was almost not going to finish the master's program, but I thought, well, I started it, I'm going to finish. So I did finish it. The I, master's in social work? The master's in social work. And I did have a computer, but nothing sophisticated like what they have now. Um, I could not talk, and it would just write for me, <laughs> which is, like, wonderful. By the You met Dad at UC Riverside, right? right? During your undergrad? Right. Okay. And so by the time you started at San Diego State, how soon after you started your master's of social work did you have Alan? Or did you have him during your second? Okay, so after I graduated as a social worker, I began to work as a social worker. And with that money, I began to pay for a second master's uh, in animal behavior that I created in the special master's program. Okay. And that was from 1983 to 1986, I did all that. And in 1984, 1983, I pregnant with my first child. And uh, he was born in 1984. Um, I'd finished all the classes and everything, like Danny said, all the thesis, all the dissertation, except for one class by the time Danny was born in 1987. And that one class took me, because now he was this new mom trying to figure out, as a mom with a disability, uh, because my, my major thing was that Whoever was caring for them, would that person be their mom? How could I be their mom if I wasn't changing their diapers? If I wasn't, how do you identify what a mom is? And I really, my studies were almost secondary. Mm-hmm. But even through all that, I applied for a PhD program at UC Davis in um, animal behavior. They accepted me into psychology again with an emphasis in animal behavior. And they said after a year, if I didn't like the psychology program, they would transfer me into the animal behavior program. I was ecstatic. (laughs) Um, But for many reasons, and majorly because I struggled. I struggled with the whole thing, parent versus PhD, and and everything else I had to do. And, And I took a break from the graduate program to be a mom and to work as a social worker. And I didn't go back. I wish I had, and I wish at that point. I'm sorry you never went back. I am too. It's a major regret of my life. I loved having you as a mom. Thanks. (laughs) And I loved being a mom, and I tried to be a good one. I think you were. Thank you. (laughs) How do you think overall STEM culture could be improved today? I would say exposure to the possibilities and reach those people maybe new with their disabilities or at campuses. You don't have to isolate out disabled groups, but make sure they're part of that discussion. 
but I think overall, I was exposed to, to um, professions where I could talk. No one even moved me out of that category into the category that where I could be a scientist or where I could work in, in technology or, or engineering or any of that that, 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 that wasn't brought to me as even a possibility. Mm-hmm. You know, so I think including all of that, not limiting, again, not limiting what we can do because someone looks at us and says, oh, no, you have a disability, you're not capable or you're not going to be able. So I think exposure. Mm -hmm. Uh, Let's expose um, individuals to that. And as graduate students, I felt very isolated. Mm -hmm. And there were no specific support groups. And in graduate school, I don't know, I think that the assumption is that you're going to be able to do this on your own. Um, And so the accommodations, they probably were there, but I used them less Mm -hmm. because I just thought now, and because of my experiences before, that I could do this on my own. Again, there's that part of me that just wants to be, you know, independent. I want to be like everyone else. Um, The Department of Rehabilitation said, no, you cannot be employed in this science field. They made this decision. They made that assumption. But as a social worker, you could be employed. Mm -hmm. That changed the direction of my life forever. So not to make assumptions, not to stop us before we even get started. Exposure. Yeah. Well, we're really hoping this episode will help other people hear stories that they haven't heard before. But also maybe we can hear more about this conversation. Thanks, Mom. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to get this out here, get this message out there. Yeah, well, duh. (laughs) (laughs) I think you're awesome, so I want everyone to hear about you. Aw. Okay. Love you, bye. Next, we have our interview with Patrick. Uh, Patrick is a psychology graduate student, and he is also autistic. He prefers identity first language, but he's going to explain that in the interview and he explained it so amazing that we're going to leave that up to him um but we connected with him thanks to an interaction that we had with stairway to stem on twitter and they are amazing that's their twitter twitter handle is stairway to stem and we will also have them linked in our show notes But we really want to thank Jessica, who helped us connect with Patrick. Hi, Jessica. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you both so much. Um, Stairway to STEM is an organization that really strives to help autistic students transition from high school into college. And so we really want you to go check them out. But um, here is Patrick. All right. So um, the voice you're hearing now, this is Danny. Hi. Hi. This is Brooke. Hello. Hi. So we're going to get started with this interview. And so first we wanted to ask you, do you prefer identity first language or person first language? Well, I prefer identity first language. Um, So for a long time, people in the disability world would always say a person with a disability, like a person with autism. And the idea behind that is we're putting the person first and thereby uh, helping to avoid stigma, remembering that people are, are people first and not defined by their disabilities. But then some autistic advocates, uh, Jim Sinclair was a real pioneer in this area, uh, started to think, well, wait a second. Uh, we don't do this for pretty much any other thing, right? Like, we don't do this for our nationality. We don't do this for our ethnicity. We don't do this for our sexual orientation or gender identity. Um what we do do this for is things like person with anger management problems or person with substance misuse problems, things that we oh. would probably think of as very negative. And so the argument is that actually 
person first language is kind of stigmatizing and reflecting a negative view of autism and disability, but we should take pride in our identities um, and put the and be fully comfortable identifying with them. Wow, thank you so much. I I had read some about this beforehand, um, but I hadn't gotten that viewpoint yet, which I think is really great to have kind of that history behind it. So thank you so much for that. Yeah, no, um, thank you. It was a great question. <laughs> so um, I'm wondering what type of research that you do. Right. So I'm kind of sort of on the periphery of STEM uh, in that I'm in a psychology program. But I actually am um, uh, doing a lot of autism research, um, which, you know, is just reflecting my own interest as an autistic person and a member of this autistic community. Uh, more specifically, I'm interested in sensory processing and autism, something that was uh, very difficult for me when I was uh, – younger and the heterogeneity in sensory processing and autism. So we're recording brain activity electrically um, in response to these different sounds and then trying to use clustering techniques to identify subgroups of autistic and typically developing kids based on their sensory processing patterns. Wow, that sounds really interesting. Well, I certainly think so, but, uh, you know, it's pretty hard to research something if you're not interested in it, so. <laughs> oh, yeah. <That's> so true. <laughs> well, and sometimes you think you're interested in it, and then you start diving into it, and then uh, and then it ends up not being interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that is uh, a danger because uh, – how one learns about things uh, in the classroom and how one actually does research in a field is not always necessarily exactly the same thing, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, very true, very true. So we're curious, um, and you had actually brought this up as a great question to ask, um, but when you decided to attend graduate school, what was your decision process on disclosing whether or not you're an autistic student? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a really difficult challenge that we face, whether or not we're going to disclose. Uh, I specifically decided that I was going to disclose because, like I said, I am actually interested in autism research. It's pretty difficult to explain why I'm interested without revealing the fact that I'm autistic. It's sort of central to my decision process. Mm -hmm. um, and as well, there's the additional advantage of disclosure that it allows you to sort of sound out how accepting a program might be, whether people are um, open-minded towards autism and disability. So those are advantages. But on the other hand, uh, there are a number of disadvantages. Um, there's a lot of stigma around autism. And then just there's the fact that it's unfamiliar uh, to a lot of people. And you know, if you're a faculty mentor and you're looking at potentially getting a graduate student, then you're looking at several years of your uh, time uh, spent on, on this mentorship. And it might be frightening or off-putting or creating a lot of uncertainty if you're uh, looking at somebody who has a different neurotype um, that you're unfamiliar with. And if there's a lot of applicants, that might create a lot of pressure um, in favor of selecting a safer um, neurotypical candidate, if that makes sense, um, which is very unfortunate because, of course, that's discrimination, um, but there's little that we can do about it. So I disclose, but, you know, I, I'm certainly not saying that everybody should disclose or, or recommending it. I think people have to think long and hard about what's right for, for them in their particular context. Yeah, um, yeah. You did mention the term neurotypical a few times, and I was wondering if you could define that for our listeners. Ah, yes, good point. I can easily slip into my jargon. Um, <laughs> neurotypical um, means somebody who uh, is typically developing, um, meaning that they're not autistic and they also wouldn't have any other sort of divergent neurotype. Um, okay. So a neurodivergent person might be an autistic person, but also maybe a person with ADHD. Both of those are neurodivergent, whereas somebody who's neurotypical doesn't have any of those diagnoses. Okay. And can I ask you about another word that I learned about recently that's related to neurotypical and neurodivergent? Yeah, for sure. Um, it's the term neurodiverse. Have you heard of that term? Yes, yes. Um, I actually am, am very interested in sort of the whole neurodiversity uh, movement and paradigm. 
Um, my faculty mentor and I are co-organizing a neurodiversity summit at UC Davis on May 31st. Uh, we're bringing in um, scholars, autistic and neurotypical, uh, from as far away as the UK. We'll have all sorts of panels. Um, it'll be really interesting, I think. Um, uh, as far as neurodiversity specifically, it's like the plural form of neurodivergent. So a neurodivergent person oh. is like a specific person who's autistic or who has ADHD or, or whatever. And neurodiverse is referring to a group of people, maybe including neurotypicals, maybe not, who are different. Their minds are different from each other. Their brains are different from each other. Okay. Very cool. Okay. Thank you. And, Patrick, do you mind after um, our interview, if I email you, could I get that those conference details? Because maybe that's something, if you would like, we could advertise. Oh, absolutely, and it'll all be filmed as well, even if people can't attend in person, and it's totally free. So, yeah, I will send you the flyer. Okay, oh, wonderful. wonderful. Thank you. Thanks. No, thank you. <laughs> so um, we're also wondering uh, what your experience in grad school so far has been like being an autistic person, and if there has been a huge difference from your undergraduate um, degree and being an undergraduate student as to being a graduate student. Right. Um, so I, I think I was uh, hinting at the sort of differences between an undergraduate and graduate degree before um, in that it is very different uh, being in a classroom and having very explicit structure, very explicit expectations, um, and then going into graduate school and being expected to work more independently and autonomously. Um, there is... Uh, some overlap because there is sort of an expectation um, that you might have some research experience, um, maybe volunteering in a lab as an undergraduate or working as a lab manager between your undergraduate and graduate degrees. So that would kind of provide a bit of a bridge there, but certainly they, they look very differently. And as far as being a, an autistic student specifically, um, it's, um, well, it's, it's complicated because often it's not just autism. I'm very privileged in that I'm more or less than just um, just autistic. Uh, I don't have additional co-occurring challenges for the most part, but a lot of people, you know, maybe there's the co-occurring ADHD. Um, maybe their autistic identity intersects with um, uh, something like uh, a non-binary gender identity or mm -hmm. uh, a minority racial group or something. Um, a lot of people, uh, probably most autistic people, are uh, really struggling with mental health as well. So all of that creates additional challenges uh, in terms of whether it's easier or more difficult to function as an undergraduate student versus a graduate student. It's, it's very variable because um, graduate programs, there's um, more more flexibility, which creates more opportunities sometimes for people to design their own environments to make sense for them and work for them, but also there's less of that explicit structure and um, there's um, therefore more opportunity perhaps for things to become uh, more challenging and for there not to be as easy a solution. So it's hard to say. Yeah, but I like answer. With all... Oh, no, I, I really like that answer. And, um, and really it just shows how, you know, if you're autistic or neurotypical, we all have the same challenges when it comes to grad school, you know? Um, to a large extent, yeah, yeah. A lot of the things are overlapping because autistic people might have some additional challenges um, uh, as, as well, but most of the challenges will be, be shared. Uh, they just might impact people uh, more severely. Um, so, yeah. for example, there might be, you know, somebody might have a, a sensory sensitivity or um, they might really struggle with networking and small group discussions, fast-moving, mm -hmm. rapid-paced things, um, and those are very specific challenges that um, would be more likely to happen for an autistic student. But uh, something like mental health um, is something that probably all graduate students struggle with to greater or lesser degrees, but maybe if you have those additional challenges that come with being autistic, that might then um, increase your stress levels and aggravate the mental health problems, which is why they'd be so much more common among autistic students. 
Yeah, yeah, and thank you for for that clarification. I realized I said we all have the same struggles. That's not not quite right. So thank you. For well, that. yeah, I mean it's kind of a controversial controversial point because people worry that if we move away from recognizing the the validity of disability, then that could um, could be a negative thing. So mm-hmm. these are such complicated questions, though, and, and there's both overlap and dissimilarity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what do you see as the cultural aspects of graduate school, and how might that relate to receiving or acquiring accommodations? Right. Um, So there is this pressure in graduate school to publish or or perish, right? That's the phrase that we use, and that creates this situation where people are really expected to go off and uh, be autonomous and complete um, uh, high quality independent work um, and we might talk about the need for like work life balance and we might talk about the need to be um, accepting uh, of um, diversity uh, but there are these structural factors um, that sort of create stigmas against anybody who is not like a, a proper, super hardworking graduate student who, like, doesn't eat or sleep or have a life um, in, in mm-hmm. a way, it's, it's very difficult to, to balance all of that uh, for, for anyone, especially if there is a disability that is maybe going to mean that you have um, less energy to get things done, you have more stress in your daily life. Um, and so even if you don't require explicit formal accommodations, then there is this uh, immense pressure that, that people are, are under. I mean, to end on a positive note, there is also the flexibility that comes with independent work, and it makes it easier to sort of structure things for yourself. But um, a lot of graduate students with disabilities um, uh, will probably want to find a program where those cultural aspects are um, as uh, as minimal as possible, where there is a more uh, flexible and open and understanding culture. Um, so, something that we were uh, wondering is that did you ha- or have you experienced any type of roadblocks or barriers in graduate school that um, a neurotypical individual would not have experienced? Right, right. Um, well, we sort of hinted at this already. Like I was talking, for example, about the difficulties that come with networking um, because a one-on-one conversation is difficult enough. You're expected to deliver answers instantaneously. You're expected to show reciprocity. You're expected to monitor the other person's facial expressions and their feedback and their behaviors. Um, you're expected to show interest in them and think about what they're thinking. And you're expected to do all of this at once in a period of just a few moments. And maybe if you don't have a brain that's explicitly designed to do that, that's difficult. And then you throw in a small group conversation where you have to do this with several people at once and monitor turn-taking and try and find your place to inject yourself into the conversation. And this is getting really, really complicated, right? I, I, it, that's just one example of, of something that would be very difficult for uh, for many of us and that um, I have certainly had difficulty with in the past is, is networking, um, which is very important for uh, graduate students if we want to be getting to know people in our field and stuff. I mean, I have my coping strategies. I go to explicit events where, where there's like meeting the visiting professor and I try to talk as much as I can to make sure that I'm remembered. But um uh, these are, are things that are, are difficult for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. And when you say that um, kind of your coping strategy to go and talk to a professor, is that when that professor is alone? Um, no, not generally. Like in the, generally in the um, visiting lunch, there will be a bunch of other graduate students. So um, it's a question of talking enough that I remembered, well, you know, not – being like obnoxiously over participating. It, it's such a difficult <laughs> I, I practice so that I'm I've gotten better at it, but um when you try and break down all the steps that go into social interaction it's usually incredibly complicated, astonishingly so, and you wonder how on earth do I do this on a day to day basis. Yeah. Wow, well, yeah. Thank you so much for that. Because the way you broke that down and talked about, you know, how complicated it is, because it is, and it's something yeah. 
you know, I think a neurotypical person does, I don't know, fairly easily. Um, so yeah, I, I, mean, I think the way you broke that down was really great. Um, so coming into a graduate student community, did you have a hard time with interpersonal relationships? I guess this gets a little bit, you know, kind of repetitive with our conversation about about networking, but maybe with other graduates. I can I can I can make it interesting. Um, <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> so this might be a slightly long and philosophizing answer, but um, we're here for I, it. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I think it's interesting to think about how our society works compared to practically all other societies, because generally people have lived in these very small communities where there's a sort of a network of acquaintances that are chosen for them. Maybe they live in a rural area and they're just limited to those people who live in that same rural area. Or maybe they live in a very stratified class society where even though they're in an urban area, they have certain acquaintances that are really picked out for them and their family and that aren't going to be very variable. Um, so people are more or less stuck with certain friends. Um, for better or worse, but that's not how our society works. We have these giant urban centers. We have all this mobility. People are moving around. People are totally free to hang out with whomever they please, and this has both a positive and a negative aspect. The negative aspect is that there's a lot of competition that goes into friendships because you have to persuade people to hang out with you, which is difficult. The positive side, on the other hand, is it creates more opportunity for people to hang out with people who are genuinely similar to themselves, to actually find people with whom they feel a strong sense of similarity, um, not just people who coincidentally happen to um, be born in the same social circles. People who have similar interests, um, people who might share our disability identity. Um, and I think that actually just the clubs that undergraduates can hang out in uh, can be very useful for creating these sort of, uh, sort of relationships. So, you know, when I was coming into Davis, um, totally new community. Um, I'd grown up in Victoria in, in Canada, lived there my whole life. And then I come down to grad school and uh, I don't know anybody. But um, I actually um, uh, found some other autistic students, and we actually uh, set up a peer support community for autistic oh, students. Cool. Um, and uh, other people might, you know, find a, a club that um, is based around some, some interest of theirs, that sort of thing. Uh, another thing, too, that I should probably mention um, uh, on this question is uh, the lab culture is, is very important as well, whether there's a lot of collaboration between graduate students or if it's a more competitive atmosphere. Um, so if you're looking at graduate programs and going around and visiting people, um, then I really recommend um, asking people who are already in the program or the lab in question uh, to get a sense of what the culture is like. Um, mm -hmm. It's really helpful if you have that collaborative spirit. Yeah, that's a really great point. Really great point. Can I ask how you might word an email like that? Because you would, would you have to disclose in order to ask that question, or would it be more broad? I mean, I think a lot of neurotypical students ask that question um, about the collaboration um, and the competitive atmosphere. Um, it might mm -hmm. be something even that's easier handled in person because uh, a lot of the time, certainly in psychology, people will visit graduate programs that they're interested in um, and go around and actually meet um, graduate students who are already in the program. And I think mm -hmm. it's a natural question um, to ask, well, what's the, the culture like? Do you um, collaborate with a lot of other graduate students? Are pe people in this program friendly and helpful? Um, but if you can't do that, then um, you can just send um, a pol polite email. Um, you could even ask if the graduate student uh, who's already in that person's lab has time for a video call. It is, it is delicate, though, because, of course, the graduate student is going to potentially report back anything unusual or, or weird to their faculty mentor. Um, but I think that enough neurotypical students ask that question that it's not, not unusual. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So I, what would you wish that uh, your peers or the listeners to this podcast uh, knew um, about how you would like to be interacted with? Yeah, that's a, an absolutely excellent question, but I, I think I'm going to tweak it just a little because oh, I am 
I am one autistic person, and we have this saying in the autism world that if you've met one autistic person, you have met one autistic person. <laughs> uh, we are so incredibly different from one another uh, mm-hmm. that what is true of me may not be true of somebody else. Um, but one thing that I think it's important for everybody to know is that there's some studies that really emphasize um, just how much sort of automatic um, uh, discriminatory negative judgment is applied to autistic people. Um, these are studies that are being done by people like uh, uh, Ruth Grossman and, and Noah Sasson, um, where they are uh, just taking these still images of autistic people or very short video clips um, and showing them to neurotypical people and also showing these people um, images and clips of neurotypical individuals. And remarkably, just this still image or short video clip is enough to elicit a very negative judgment. So there's something very subtle about how autistic people look, how we carry ourselves, something about our style not the substance of what we say. They actually could not just, there was no negative judgment applied to the content of what autistic people were saying when it was transcribed. It was something about the delivery. And you can imagine that um, whether it's trying to navigate um, our competitive friendship society and identify friends, whether it's trying to um, interview for some position, whether it's a grad school position or some other position, um, whatever it is that's going to create a lot of automatic discrimination against autistic people and maybe people with other disabilities as well. And I think that's something that's important for people to be mindful of um, so that they can be aware when they're doing this um, and work to override this automatic stigma. Yeah, thank you so much for that. I hadn't I hadn't heard of that study, so I really yeah. appreciate you bringing it up. It's very new, very recent. Um, I think just in the last two or three years is when we've started seeing these studies. Okay. Um, I'm going to follow up with you after and see if you can help me find that study, because I think it would be great to put in our show notes for anyone that's interested. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Um, all right. All right, and then, Patrick, we just wanted to finish up with one last question because uh, we love talking about success. <laughs> and right. so we wanted to know, what are your successes in grad school? Well, um, I'm only in my second year, um, so I don't want to uh, be overly presumptuous and, like, declaring <laughs> victory or whatever. Um, but, you know, I think I've... Um, uh done various things that I'm uh, pretty proud of. Um, uh, I've presented various posters and um, I'm currently doing um, some interesting analyses what I was talking about earlier with the clustering of those electrophysiological data. Um, uh, and uh, I am looking forward to at some point in the future um, hopefully being able to publish some of those results. I think they're very interesting. Um, I've also, I think, been able to keep a reasonable balance and, you know, remain true to my sort of um, identity as a, an autistic uh, person uh, and incorporate that as well into what I'm doing. So I, I mentioned that there's that peer support group and the Neurodiversity Summit um, and other things. Uh, I also finally finally started writing a blog, um, which was like on my list of goals to do at some point for for ages. I started that a few months ago. Um, oh, great! Yeah. Is that is that the um, autisticscholar dot org? Is that your blog? Uh, yeah, autisticscholar dot com. Um, oh, dot com. My bad. Yeah, uh, that's the one. I started it in uh, August, I think. Well, that's yeah. amazing! Congratulations on starting that. I know some for me also the idea of starting something and then actually starting it sometimes yeah. are separated. <laughs> yes, yes, very much so. Well, thank you. <laughs> all right, Patrick. Well, that was all of our questions. Um, yeah, thank you for, for having me, and um, I look forward to seeing what comes out of it. Thank you all so much for listening today. Uh, Next time, we'll be starting a new series called Work and Life and Balance. The first episode is going to be called Work. 
work, 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 and no, 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 meh, 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 what what is yours? I don't I don't know. I was just dancing. Do you even know that song? Yeah. Work 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 work. You can't quite like distinguish what she's saying. You just right. Work 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 I just don't know mm-hmm. words to songs. Anyways, <clears throat> we will discuss time management as it relates to your PhD and campus life. In the meantime, let us know your favorite way or perhaps a useful but hated way uh, to manage your time. You can find us on Twitter at STEM Culture, one word, or email us at stemculturepodcast at gmail.com. If you like what we're doing, please rate us on iTunes to help more people interested in improving STEM culture find us. Please, 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 please. Yes, please. If you'd like to support us, you can find us on our Patreon, on our website, plus show notes, articles to stimulate, and links to our YouTube channel of transcribed shows at www.stemculturepodcast.com. And if you'd like to interact more with our guest speakers, you can check out our website for their bios and contact info under the tab uh, nicely labeled as guests. Until next time, don't forget to consensually hug a grad student or at least buy them a coffee or tea or more coffee. Lots and lots of coffee. Yeah. Or caffeine tablets. Mm -hmm. Maybe not those. (laughs) What does DNA stand for? Deoxyribose nucleic acid. National Dyslexic Association. (laughs) (laughs) I really like that. (laughs) Took me a second. Uh, I know, I was like... But the end came first. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm good at getting jokes. <laughs>